Uh, hello, World of Students. This is China Part 2. Um, so you'll see just in the bottom of the front page on neighbors under Hong Kong. We'll start there and keep going on the back. Uh, so there's one big thing to write down here for uh, Hong Kong, just a, a chunk there at the bottom. That is, uh, Hong Kong has been and still is the international trading hub of Asia. Thus, foreign influence has controlled Hong Kong, right? So for most of Asia, uh, I mean, you know, in terms of the products and goods and consumable items that we have in the U.S., so many of them come uh, from Asia, whether it's from South Asia or Southeast Asia or Eastern Asia, manufactured, Taiwan, China, whatever, all of the mass-produced goods you see at Walmart, etc. So many of them come from there. So Hong Kong has been a big international trading hub, geez, post um, Sun Yat-sen's expelling of many foreign influences, you still saw Hong Kong being held on by foreign influence, uh, namely Britain, right? So you want to keep writing here that uh, the People's Republic of China did not control Hong Kong until 1997 when Britain handed it over to them in an agreement called One Country, Two Systems. All right, so the People's Republic of China did not control Hong Kong until 1997 when Britain handed over control to them in an agreement called One Country, Two Systems. You can put One Country, Two Systems in quotes if you'd like. Um, so there is, uh, you know, there's that angle, One Country, Two Systems. You can break it down as to what that might mean, and <clears throat> I think, uh, if I were to throw it out there, Jada, what do you think that means? Um, <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Yeah, that you have China, the People's Republic of China, uh, the CCP, Chinese Communist Party, they control things in China, and so hence it's being one country. However, they will allow Hong Kong to maintain many of the civil liberties. Many of you identified correctly what political liberalization was. Many of the civil liberties and rights, voting, etc., <clears throat> freedom of speech and press and protest, uh, many of them, not all of them, that they had when they were controlled by foreign influence, namely Britain. So the whole world was really concerned. Uh, and in fact, you want to keep writing here. Surprisingly, the PRC has allowed citizens of Hong Kong to retain many of their political freedoms. <clears throat> Surprisingly, the PRC has allowed the citizens of Hong Kong to retain many of their political freedoms. Whether from the Tiananmen Square incident or the fact that it's a different communist authoritarian style government that has more economic liberties but not as many political ones, um, Whatever reasoning, many people assume that Hong Kong would very quickly lose their rights um, and all of that. In Utah, there are proselyting missionaries, etc., from here that go to Hong Kong, etc. Um, other NGOs, non government organizations, have more of a presence there, <clears throat> mainly from tradition that it's been used to. Uh, they've been used to that. And the PRC would lose probably legitimacy, the CCP would lose legitimacy if they. They clamped down too hard. Now, there was, in 2014 and 2015, there was the Umbrella Brigade, in which they protested, uh, we'll post that time, they protested the, the CCP's move to have more control over elections in Hong Kong, because that's, that's a different system than you might find in, um, <clears throat> in mainland China. This special administrative region, as they call it, SAR, <clears throat> Is, uh, is interesting in that they haven't given many freedoms, but they did try to clamp down a little bit on them. There was some protest. I'm not going to test you on that. And uh, this past year, there was a, a revamping, a resurgence of protests. And um, there have been some recent controversies over some of those who were vocal protesters being arrested. Um, but nowhere near the civil rights abuses that, that many people thought would happen. So, I mean, that's something good. That's, that's a good angle. Okay, um, so I hope that explains. Some of you might be wondering, well, wait, like there's Hong Kong and a sibling, a brother, a cousin called there on a mission, religious mission. I thought mainland China didn't allow missionaries, and, and, um, and you're not wrong. It's just that it's a neighbor. It's a part of China. It's one country, two systems. Uh, and it's almost as if we were to annex, geez, Calgary, right, in Canada. Calgary probably would like that, 
but they would still also be used to a parliamentary system, so we make allowances, and they have sort of one country, two systems. Um, some might say, that's what we did to Texas. Texas, while well, having a lone republic state for a minute, um, it also absorbed very well into the normal federal style that we have in the United States. So that's why it's, yes, part of China, but it's also a different system politically and economically. Um, okay, now we get to another sticky spot, and that's Taiwan. So on the back page, you want to flip it over there. Uh, we're going to write down one thing under Taiwan, and that is Taiwan and the PRC <clears throat> have traditionally been enemies, uh, but recent economic ties have cooled the relationship. The PRC is upset at the U.S. for pledging $6.4 billion worth of military support to Taiwan. And the PRC is upset at the U.S. for pledging more than $6.4 billion worth of military support to Taiwan. Okay, <clears throat> so if you were to look, um, Taiwan, <clears throat> by, by, by many, and even in the UN's considerations, will consider Taiwan not a special administrative region, but really its own separate country. Um, and it's that island off of mainland China, right? Highly populated, densely populated urban area. And Taiwan is sort of the South Korea, if you will, um, uh, in terms of the U.S.'s relationship. However, we have, especially since the late 60s and 70s, thanks to, thanks some part to Mao and Deng Xiaoping, open up relationships for trade with China. We have democratically been like allies with Taiwan because Taiwan uh, was started more or less by um, Chinese nationalists who left or were exiled and pushed out of mainland China under Chiang Kai-shek to be there. Um, so it's that's a part of their history that Taiwan and China really were all the same. But when Mao took over and was the Communist Party leader and Chiang Kai-shek, those who were non-communists were sort of pushed out, exiled, lost the war, if you will, uh, around the 1930s. When that happened and they shifted and moved over to Taiwan, you started to see like two different Chinas, if you will. Um, and that was controversial. 50s, 60s, 70s, that was controversial. Even the UN was like, what do we recognize as the the legitimate China. You have some of the leaders exiled to Taiwan who are non-communists. You have those who are communists um, uh, who live in mainland China. And there was sort of this controversy, or as the British say, controversy. I, I, I love that pronunciation. Um, this controversy between the two. And uh, the U.S. and many, the U.N., etc., really in the late 70s, uh, recognized the PRC as the legitimate China. Um, much to the chagrin of Taiwan. Uh, and President Trump has sort of used this relationship to play trade war with China, which has been controversial too. Uh, congratulating the Prime Minister upon being elected in Taiwan, which hasn't really been done for a while because we don't want to alienate China. Um, even President Obama pledged billions of dollars of military support to Taiwan um, in case there is a cooling effect that then got hotter, if you will in terms of conflict, to have allies there. So it's it's a little complicated, a little, I don't want to say lover's triangle, but sort of like that, of, of who has the U.S.'s allegiance. And, and recently, my goodness, the trade war, even pre-quarantine stuff, was real between the U.S. and China. And we're still not out of it as to um, tariffs on this product and tariffs on that. Trying, both sides are trying to broker good trade deals between the two, because one's a huge consumer base, one's a huge producer base. And you want to broker those good trade deals. Uh, and hopefully, knock on wood, those relationships can be improved because I think economically, worldwide, that can help out tremendously. Um, but Taiwan is sort of this other player that economically isn't as huge, but is democratically um, convenient for the US to play to a bit, if that makes sense. Um, so in, in the PRC's dreams, they, and I say dreams, hopes, desires, mentalities, political scientists and historians would say, man, you know, having Hong Kong, Tibet, Xinjiang, um, <clears throat> uh, Taiwan all come to the fold of the PRC is really, you know, an ideal situation. Um, and, uh, and it's almost in a sense like imagine if Puerto Rico were to be like booming economically, tons of products being made. 
the U.S. would be moving to annex Puerto Rico more as a state, you know, like that, provide more connection. Uh, that's not the case, but that's where China is. So if you're wondering, like, what their stance is in those other areas. They would like them to come in to the fold, if you will, as a full country. Um, but as of yet, no. Taiwan's considered really a separate country by most. Hong Kong is one country, two systems. Um, so it is part of mainland China, but also a different system. Macau, which is close to it, is in a similar way. Uh, and Xinjiang and Tibet are also known as special administrative regions, where in Tibet they're allowed f some freedom to worship how they wish. <coughs> for instance, uh, but still not full independence, right? Okay, so under people, there's two things you're going to write down here for people. Um, uh, under party, that is, right? The first is the CCP has been able to inspire nationalistic pride in its predominantly Han, H-A-N. So it's been able to inspire nationalistic pride in its predominantly Han people by pointing to their recent economic success. Okay, they know to inspire nationalistic pride, meaning like, yeah, go China, 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 um, or CCP, PRC, you know, however you want to say it. They've been able to inspire nationalistic pride uh, in its Han people, we'll break that down in a second, uh, by pointing to their economic success. Now, for 5,000 points, <laughs> non-existent points, um, uh, Ellie, any thoughts on what's ironic about the Chinese Communist Party pointing to its recent economic success as a source of pride? Yeah, yes, you got it. Um, the, the problem with that is much of their success recently that has happened in the last, oh geez, 15 years or so, 20 years, 30 years, has been built on more capitalist principles and in a form they more likely call state capitalism, where the state controls certain sectors of the economy and individual business leaders can do their own thing too, hence more economic freedom. So that's sort of an irony, um, and it's similar to, uh, geez, the U.S. Yeah, that's probably not the right analogy here. Okay, in the Valley, Skyview versus Green Canyon. And if Skyview were to um, take uh, Dan McClure, our great boys basketball coach, um, uh, and use his game plans, et cetera, to bring them to another state championship, uh, they can point to Dan McClure and say, this is the reason why we're so successful. Yeah, go Skyview. But the irony is that he actually just came from Green Canyon. You know, so it's sort of that irony of, of what, what's the reason for your success. Uh, but the Han majority is sort of in, similar to the U.S. as an Anglo-Saxon, where we have the majority is Caucasian, uh, Anglo-Saxon, Western Europe, Germanic-type influence, Britannia, etc. In China, it's the Han uh, majority, which is... Uh, your traditional majority there. There are some minority groups, uh, right? Tibetans, for instance, are minority groups, or, or Uyghurs, like we talked about. Um, they're minority groups, but majority of them are Han, if that makes sense. So when you say Han, you're thinking, like in Japan, the Yamoto people who, when you think of somebody who's Japanese stereotypically, you're like, oh, okay, that's their look and the bone structure, the skin tone, etc. Han is what you think there. And, and remember, i got to be very clear here, a lot of people assume that anybody in Asia is going to be shorter than those in like the Western world. Wrong, wrong, wrong. Southeast Asia, that probably holds up more or less. Japan holds up more or less. Korea, China, no. I mean, average height, we're not saying, thinking Yao Ming, you know, for everybody, but their average height is much taller than you think. And you go there and you're like, oh, oh, okay. Like I'm 6'4", and going there like it's not this big disconnect in terms of height. Like it is a, to a degree, but the Han are not diminutive people. No, no, no. Um, okay, let's go to the second thing you'll write down here for people, and that is under party. Um, there we go. So though there are only a few ethnic minorities, like we've talked about already, though there are only a few ethnic minorities, there is some linguistic difference. So though there are only a few ethnic minorities, um, there is some linguistic difference. Uh, okay, for five points, what does linguistic difference mean? Uh, anybody? Um, <laughs> uh, ding, 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 Leo, yes. Linguistic means language, not a form of linguini. 
uh, means language. There's some linguistic difference. Anybody know what the main linguistic difference is there? Okay, keep writing the second part that the PRC tends to favor Mandarin, not Cantonese. Uh, I, you can go so far as to say those are completely different languages. Similar alphabet in terms of symbols, not alphabet, but symbols. Um, but they can be read in different ways, and the is just upon hearing it, it's vastly different. What's an analogy for us? Oh man, I guess you could say Portuguese and Spanish. You know, really different languages, really different languages. Uh, even though there is um, some linguistic heritage between the two, uh, in terms of the conquistadors and so forth. Cantonese and Mandarin. Cantonese is spoken predominantly in Hong Kong, right? Because now we see that disconnect. And Mandarin is spoken on the mainland. And I mentioned this before, credit to the CCP for helping normalize and standardize, at least everybody knowing, schooling, etc. Mandarin, a, a traditional Mandarin dialect. And then each of the provinces have, uh, like Wuhan or Guangdong, like their own different dialects of those um, languages. And that helps normalize it a ton for that many people. So kudos to them for making that work. And that's an advantage. Some say, what's an advantage of a more authoritarian government? Um, is that you can normalize it. Heck, uh, even their uh, social media communication apps, uh, money apps, etc., are so streamlined because it's all through central planning that uh, some might say it's, it's more invasive, but it is more streamlined. So, so there's a, a give and take there. Okay. Um, under the one child policy, uh, yeah, let's go under one child policy. There's one main thing we're going to write down in this section, and that is during the Cultural Revolution, Mao said having kids was a good thing. However, Deng Xiaoping instituted a one child policy. So during the Cultural Revolution, Mao said having kids was a good thing. Have kids, have kids, have kids. Sounds almost like the Ayatollah in Iran, like have kids, have kids. Um, heck, after the World War II, there was a concept of like have kids, you know, for the U.S. So at, during the Cultural Revolution, which was um, boof, in the late 50s and 60s, uh, in China, if I'm remembering the dates correctly there, that he pushed and said, hey, have more kids. When he passed away, Deng Xiaoping, the new leader, said, uh, okay, we have to institute a one-child policy, right? So you're talking from like really the 80s and 90s and for most of the aughts, you had most of China, there are important exceptions we'll talk about, following the one-child policy. Um, so what is this? Keep writing here that this gave incentives or free abortions to those who followed the law and penalties or taxes and fines to those who didn't. Gave incentives or free abortions to those who follow the law and uh, penalties, taxes, and fines to those who didn't. Um, so, for three decades or so, most of China was following the one child policy because their population, this is interesting, China was isolated even in their dynastic time for most of the European wars. They were isolated and, and uh, protected in a way. Yes, they had the, the Huns and they had different invaders at times, Mongols, yes. Um, but, but they didn't have as much war, if you will, uh, externally as, say, Russia did, as we talk about with Russia. So you had a population number that was pretty big already and a nice insulated way that helped breed more and more. Um, I don't know if breed's the right word. Uh, just more of a population boost at times. They weren't decimated by some huge bubonic plague or anything like that. So as time went on, uh, having kids and then they had a developing country now getting more developed economically where you had more consumers and cities and Deng Xiaoping opened up economies so people were looking to move to the cities and it wasn't like subsistence farming where the death rates were higher. You're having more of a comfortable middle class life. Numbers are burgeoning. So they had to do a population control thing of one child policy. You live in the cities especially uh, on the eastern seaboard where most of the population is in China in those cities for sure you had a one-child policy where to help institute this they said hey look we have state-funded abortions which yes for many is controversial um, uh, but they would say unlike Iran where it was like family planning in uh, China it's you know state abortion clinics like we can help administer this to enable this child policy to be followed and it's free the government takes care of it cool um, for those who didn't I want to be clear here 
Uh, there are not cases that we have heard and read and all this stuff that people are thrown in jail for having uh, more than one kid. And to answer the question, uh, multiple births, you know, so uh, twins or triplets, sorry, uh, families weren't forced to choose one or the other. That's not, that's not the case. Um, they were able to have it, and that's counted as a birth, right? Uh, but for those who acknowledge and consciously say, yes, but I want to have more than one child, they'd have an increase in taxes and fines to um, de-incentivize people from having too many kids, strain on resources, et cetera. So for 30 plus years, this is a, a big policy that's there. Now, if you live out in the West, and they got more exceptions, if you live out in the Western part of China, you know, being more in a rural part, uh, no, have more than one kid, that's fine. Um, that wasn't the, the rule, if you will. Um, but then they had like a registration, household registration system that like if you were to move from one province to the cities, you have to register with the government, you have to get permission because population controls are, are needed there. <clears throat> so what's what, some of the unintended consequences of this? Yes, it controlled population to an extent. Some of the, the unintended consequences is, I uh, keep writing here that um, their society, similar to ours, values men over women leading to female infanticide leading to female infanticide or the killing of babies right so their society their culture will favor men over women similar to ours <clears throat> uh, which led to female infanticide or killing of babies keep writing the death count is too high to measure um, but now men have a hard time finding a wife Okay, so there's like two unintended consequences. One is, um, it gotta be very clear, the CCP never is authorizing female homicide, right? Like the female homicide of infants, or the homicide of female infants, rather. They're not authorizing that at all, but families who uh, weren't able to know the gender uh, before an abortion could have been carried out, um, realize that if our one shot is then on a female, we don't want that, so many were abandoned. Many were put in orphanages, um, and that was a, a, a bad mark, I think, human rights mark. Even when China was trying to join the World Trade Organization, that was a heavy mark for them. Um, uh, additionally, you keep going in that way, and if families, and you might think, why are they valuing men more than women? Well, remember, in the U.S., we do too. Uh, it's even something as subtle as the family name, they say it more token of, if I only have one child, I want it to be a boy so that the family name can live on, right? Like the, the family name, not the given name. Um, so, so that's true. That happens in the U.S., but it's a little bit more intense there in, in many parts of Asia because it's traditional that the, the male, upon being married, the parents of the male will then live with that uh, family sort of as a retirement policy, if you will. It's culturally acceptable. It's not just accepted, but it's expected um, that that happens. And so if you don't have a male, then that oftentimes can lead to, well, you know, a female. And you are not insured as much of a comfortable retirement lifestyle later on. So as that happens, that that's where the motivation is, is of concern for the, the safety of the family as a whole. What will... I and my wife do if we just have one child that's a daughter. Um, so that was a, a sad thing for sure. And also, when you then have more men, right? So that could lead to more men being born, etc. Uh, if it's only males, it's it's harder to find wives. Yeah, there's a disparity there. So those are some unintended consequences. Um, but just like the China, the U.S. is having a, a similar problem of older aging generation, uh, and we have a um, smaller population being born from there. And hence them, for the last couple of years, uh, it's to their credit, the CCP has uh, lifted some of the bans, saying it's a two-child policy, and that if you are the child of another one-child family, then you can have two children, um, and that's good. And they eventually, they've announced they want to remove that stipulation soon, if not now, uh, because they know that population disparity. They need to balance out the older with some of the newer rising generation. Okay, uh, and the last thing we're going to do today is the future. Uh, this is looking at leaders. There's one chunk thing you're going to write down here, and that is 
Uh, there, there are some. Well, how do we say this? There are several factions in China. If you want to only allow for economic reforms, you're called a reformer. Because mind you, there's only one big party, the CCP. They do allow some of the other democratic parties to exist, um, but not necessarily in elections. Uh, they are allowed to be there in some of the bureaucracy. But um, so there are those who want to have only economic reforms are called reformers, right? So let's get more businesses and change of tax policies. You know, that, that doesn't sound communist. Communist is complete equal distribution of goods. Uh, and so they've changed up that economic side. They're called a reformer. Deng Xiaoping was a reformer. Um, uh, keep writing here, if you want political reform, you are called a liberal. Right, so if you want only economic reform, you're called a reformer. If you want political reform, you're called a liberal, uh, which is more rare, right, of having that. And it's also a different mindset. I mean, I, I want to be very clear here. Even though the data might be a little bit skewed in terms of how they rank it, for STEM sciences, the science, technology, engineering, math, when you compare them of like the top 30 developed countries, we're at the bottom of those rankings. We're routinely at 27, 28, 26. The US struggles with that type of work ethic because it's difficult, it's a challenge. Most of you could agree that for most STEM, even if you're good at it, um, it's still a challenge. It's a different way to think than maybe a, more of a social science or more of a liberal arts background. And that difficulty though is completely absorbed by many other countries, that, namely China can do that and is willing to put in the work. And that, that East Asian work ethic is amazing, is, is wonderful. And when you compare it to the U.S., man, we are found lacking. But yet, our own U.S. polling data shows the number one thing that we are at among all developed countries is self-confidence. Which, that's nice, but if you suck, then why do you have self-confidence, right? So there is this disconnect. Um, a lot of people assume that, man, we want our values to be put in China or South Korea or Japan. And at the same time, I think we can learn a ton in terms of work ethic, deference to superiors, um, maintaining of harmony in that way. I think there's something to be learned in that. So even if some of you are hearing this and saying, well, they all should be liberals so that they can have more rights. More rights and freedom of speech is good. I'm a history teacher, I would agree with that. But also, the idea is just to speak out. If you don't know what you're speaking on, then that's a problem too. So you should be learned and have work ethic and push forward and do that too. So it has to be both. I wish like we could have the best mix of both cultures, if that makes sense. Um, okay, and keep writing here in our future that the current leader, Xi Jinping, that's X-I-J-I-N-P-I-N-G, Xi Jinping, the current leader, Xi Jinping, has been considered a princeling. So like the word prince and ling, L-I-N-G, has been considered a princeling or someone with strong guangxi, G-U-A-N-X-I, someone with strong guangxi. Um, okay, so a princeling is one who has really good connections. And this is what guangxi means is like um, political favors, connections. It means connections with leaders from Mao's long march, to be completely blunt. When they did uh, the control and takeover of China, those who have connections historically to those leaders have Guangxi, like these inner connections, if you will. Um, and those strong political connections or Guangxi is what Xi Jinping's family is about. So when he first came to power, they didn't know if he was a liberal or a reformer. Um, and he's been in power for quite some time now. Well, geez, less than 10 years. Um, but he's been in power, and he will continue to stay in power because economically China is doing well, right? Uh, I mean, many economists predict by 2052 they'll su surpass the GDP of the U.S. Um, but with that said, he he won't be going anywhere soon. Uh, and what's his legacy? Is he a reformer? Is he a liberal? Um, so Prince Ling thing is true that he has connections to Mao and, and families. Mm, he's sort of a mixed bag. He isn't considered a liberal, no. He has uh, taken some steps 
to give Hong Kong freedoms, but also taking some steps to restrict them. Uh, he has been more of a middle of the road leader, but some fear he has been there a long time, right? Um, and uh, and what that means, right? Because they used to have an idea of term limits, and now that seems to be gone. They're not going to do term limits, at least for now, because things are going well. So so that's the takeaway for, for the future of China. Xi Jinping is the current leader. He is a princeling. He has strong Guangxi, or like personal connections. Um, so I hope that helps out with part two for China. We will do on Wednesday part three. We'll get to the other page on environment and odds and ends. Um, and then the review will be on the review will be on to make sure for your class Friday. Yeah, the review will be Friday. So the test will be then on Monday. So I hope you guys have a good day. See ya.